Hi there and welcome to another of the DTA screencasts. In this session we're looking at levers and it's obviously part two. So what we covered in the first half was the terms and the components and how they all interlinked. So for example we talked about EFL being a number one um, lever and number two being FLE so that's fulcrum load and effort and then last but not least was the third class lever and that was fulcrum effort and then load. So if they're new terms to you pause this screencast take a look at part one and then join us when you've finished. All right, so for those that um, have already done that, let's look at part two. And in this section, we're looking at the efficiency of levers and the impact it has on performance. It's quite an important element, this. So we'll get started straight away. So we already identified the fulcrum, load and effort and the different components. So where those fulcrum, effort and loads are will now have an impact on the efficiency of our levers. Uh, what we need to do then is understand two new components that we're going to add in there and they're known as the effort arm and the load arm. All right, so let's have a look at that. So for the um, effort fulcrum and load here, what we're talking about, the effort arm is the distance from the effort there to the fulcrum and that is now known as the effort arm. And no surprise then, the distance from the load to the fulcrum between those two components there, so load and fulcrum, is the load arm. Okay, so let's put that into a practical situation. So for here we've got the fulcrum, and the distance from there to the effort, remember that attachment to the bicep is, let's say, for example, right there. That, between those two things, is known as the effort arm, and then the distance from the fulcrum to the load, which is obviously the dumbbell, is known as the load arm. So, depending on what the distance of those are will have an impact on performance. Just pause the screencast and have a think. How is that going to impact on our performance? What do you think? So let's say, for example, we've got this distance here and this distance here. So one is the load arm, that's to the fulcrum, and here is the effort arm. How is that going to impact on our performance? Okay, so let's quickly draw this out then, if we can. So we've got the um, the load was up here, wasn't it? So let's, and then we've obviously got the fulcrum here. And remember, the attachment of the bicep is to here. So there is our effort arm. There is our load arm. So what do you think is the impact of that effort arm being a lot shorter? than the load arm. That's what we're trying to work out. Okay, so what you should have worked out first and foremost, and do note this down, is the greater the distance of the effort or the load arm from the fulcrum will have a significant impact on the effort or the load. So it's a, it's a crucial part of knowing what is, is, is going to actually take place. Now, one of the things is the longer the levers are, they can actually generate greater force. So the load arm, if it becomes longer, can give greater acceleration to projectiles. But the important thing is getting that moving to start with, and that's what we're going to be looking at here. So let's have a look at each one of the classes of um, levers and then see what the advantages and disadvantages are of the, the increase or decrease in the load arms or the effort arm. So for a first class lever, so there's our load, fulcrum, and then our force, or our effort. So for this one, the greater the effort arm, the less effort is needed to move the same amount of load. So the greater the load arm is, the more force is needed to move that load. So we'll just quickly, to make some sense of that, let's have a look. Okay, here's an example of our first class lever. So because of the huge distance of the effort arm there, comparatively to the load arm, we would, with a minimal amount of effort, be able to lift quite a significant load. Now, if you turn those round and you went the other way, um, so we have, let's quickly get this done. So let's say the, let's put the fulcrum right here. Okay, and here is the effort. So that's somebody pushing down. And here we've got our load. 
it doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out that we're going to have to put a huge amount of force down on that to increase the, the speed or the velocity of that particular load. Seems relatively straightforward, okay? So that's for a first class one. Okay, so let's have a look at that again. So the greater the effort arm, the less effort is needed to move the same load. So that's that one there. And the greater the load arm, the more force is needed to move that load. That's for a first class lever. All right, hopefully that's pretty clear. So let's move on to a second class lever. So where the effort arm is greater than the load arm, a large force can be moved with a relatively small amount of, uh, uh, sorry, a large load can be moved with a relatively small amount of force. So let's have a look at that one. So this one we've got um, FLE, so that's um, FLED, isn't it? So that's our second class lever. So thinking about how we lift a barrow, you can usually with a relatively okay amount of force lift quite a large load so that's because this for this load arm here between those two points there is shorter than from the fulcrum to the effort so the longer that effort arm is there the easier it's going to be or the less force I'm going to need to apply to lift the same load now imagine if we have the, the handle was just here and you have to lift it, that's going to take a lot more effort to lift there than it is for this person to lift here. And if we go right off the end of the page, way over here, again, it's going to be less effort. So when the effort arm is greater than the load arm, a large force can be moved with a relatively, sorry, a large load can be moved with a relatively small amount of force. So let's think of the second class example we use within our bodies. And it was this one here, wasn't it? So there's the, the fulcrum, and there's the load, and there's the effort. So it's just literally the other way around, if you, you, know, if, if you can see what I mean there. So with a relatively um, low amount of force from this muscle here, we can actually lift our entire bodies. If you think about it, it's quite clever. So that's because of the use or understanding that our body, um, uh, the, the efficient use of the levers. And that's in relation to a second class one. All right, so have a pause if you need to, do some dry diagrams if you need again, but now we'll move on to the third class lever. So for our third class lever, we, um, we're here, so the load arm is greater than the effort arm, a large effort is required to move a relatively small load. Okay, so let's try and think about then. So when the load arm is greater than the effort arm, so that means that when this arm is greater than that arm, we need quite a large amount of force. So let's think about that in relation to our bicep, fulcrum to the load. So the load arm is greater than the effort arm. So if you put a 5, 10 kg, you know, use whatever relative size you want, it needs quite a large amount of effort from this bicep here because of the short distance between the fulcrum and the effort. Now let's say we could change the shape of our bodies. If we moved this point of uh, attachment to here, how much easier would that be if I had it there? So the fulcrum to the effort, so the effort arm is almost the same size as the load arm. That would make it a lot easier, a lot easier. So why they couldn't have done that, I have no idea. Anyway, so it seems that we're going to have to stick with this attachment here, and therefore we have to make quite a large amount of effort to move a relatively small load. Hopefully that makes sense. So, let's go back over the sentence. When the load arm is greater than the effort arm, a large force is required to move a relatively small load. So why on earth have our bodies been made that way? Well, one of the interesting things is it can actually act as an advantage. Once we've managed to get this load to move, we can then have quite significant momentum or velocity because of the levers that our body has created. So let's have a drawing of that one. So we're going to try and use this kicking of the football as an example. Okay, so we'll just get these attachments put on. Okay, so I've skipped on ahead there a little bit, but so we've got a fulcrum and our load there. So imagine that, excuse my drawings, imagine they've got the, the foot there. I know, I know. Okay, and then so it's a fulcrum effort then load, which is a third class lever. So remember that it's the point of attachment is here. Now, between the fulcrum and the effort, there is not a great amount of distance. 
but there is between the fulcrum and the load. So the load arm is significantly greater. So, but if we have enough force to actually move this, then momentum will allow us to accelerate and have an increase in velocity in that direction. If we have the attachment there, then you could argue it's not as it's not as efficient, and it isn't because you know over over years of um, development, our bodies have found that this is the most efficient way of, of moving. So even though this point here is very, very short, one of the advantages is if we have enough force to generate movement, then we can have a significant increase in velocity or acceleration. And there is the advantage of that third class lever. And that's a very important point to note the advantages and the disadvantages. OK, we'll go back to the PowerPoint. OK, here we go. So we've got the load. There's our fulcrum, as we mentioned. And there's the effort. Remember, the attachment of these quads is, is round here. And again, so the load, the fulcrum, and the effort is there. And that short distance between those, while it may be a disadvantage initially, if we can create that force for movement, then we can swing that foot through the ball a lot, lot more efficiently and with a greater or an increase in velocity or acceleration. So there we go. Now, let's have a look at this as an exam question just to finish off then. So here, using the example uh, of the elbow, sketch a diagram of a third class lever. So it's asking you to do that. So I mentioned what we said in, in part one is remember to use the relevant arrows and um, triangles, etc. So describe each of the components of the third class lever and their application to human movement. And then lastly, but not least, it says explain the advantages and disadvantages of a third class lever. So here is our um, exam answer. And as you can see, it's just very quickly done the diagram. So we're going to score a couple of marks there and a description of the components. Look what it does. It just breaks it down so simply. So fulcrum, load, effort. And then again, it just goes very clearly through the disadvantages and, and uh, advantages with an explanation. Because the, because the effort lies between the fulcrum and the load, closer to fulcrum than, um, than the load, or the load is further away from the fulcrum than the load, or the load needs um, significantly more force. All right, so look, just pause that, have a look through that question, and see how they've easily broken that one down. Okay, here's another one. So figure two shows the elbow again at this position of the tricep brachii when supporting a weight. Now, I had a look at this one. I was like, well, hang on a second. That's not where the attachment should be. Don't argue. Don't worry about it. Because here it very simply says this is an example of a first class lever. Don't, don't worry about it. Just accept the fact that they've done a first class lever and then do this. Explain the components of a first class lever. So let's see what they do. So the explanation of the levers components, and it basically, I think, describes, however, this is this is what seemed to be suitable for um, uh, full marks. So you're basically describing what each one of those different components are. Notice that they now add in the load arm and the effort arm. All right, making sure that you've got all of those com 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 excuse me, components in there. All right, so um, pause the screencast at any point, go back over it and make sure that we're now understanding the load arm and the effort arm and the advantages and disadvantages linked to each one of the different classes of levers. All right, thanks very much and I will speak to you soon. Bye-bye.